Greetings, salutations. This is Ronan Youngblood. This video is a response to a response. That response being my original video, which was critiquing leftist electoral tendencies and advocacy for uh, electoralism and the individual act of voting amongst persons in the left. This video is a collaboration with Overthrow Media, so be sure to check out their channel as well and leave them a like and subscribe and a comment saying that Ronan sent you. Nobody, neither leader nor rank and filer, can hold back the truth. The search for truth in local attitudes is a collective affair. Some are richer in experience and elaborate their thoughts more rapidly than the past have been able to establish a greater number of mental links. But they ought to avoid writing roughshod over the people. For the success of the decision which is adopted depends upon the coordinated, conscious effort of the whole of the people. The collective struggle presupposes collective responsibility at the base. Yes, everyone will have to be compromised in the fight for common good. No one has clean hands. There are no innocents, no onlookers. We all have dirty hands. We are all soiling them in the swamp of our country and in the terrifying emptiness of our brains. We must not voodoo the people, nor dissolve them in emotion and confusion. We must repeat it. It is absolutely necessary to oppose vigorously and definitively the birth of a national bourgeoisie and a privileged caste. This is a quote from Wretched of the Earth. Fanon, obviously. Another callback to part one, if you haven't checked it out yet. In Wretched of the Earth, Fanon quotes the first president of Gidan next. But I enjoy this analogous quote from Kropotkin, which is actually a little earlier, 1898, in Anarchism, It's Philosophy and Ideal. Feel as though bringing these two pieces together really shows what black anarchism can be. So, each individual is a cosmos of organs, each organ is a cosmos of cells, each cell is a cosmos of infinitely small ones. And in this complex world, the well-being of the whole depends entirely on the sum of well-being enjoyed by each of the least microscopic particles of organized matter. A whole revolution is thus produced in the philosophy of life. So, while this shifts from the original topic of electoralism, in seeing the reactions to the original video that we talked about in part one, it became almost immediately clear to me that a lot of the so-called left in the United States particularly those who consume left tube media and were offended by the previous video, were still replicating these same systems of domination and structural violence that we would find in any other community within a US context. But that also extended to leftist organizing communities. This being because they still internalize all of these systems of domination. It's kind of a duh, but when you think about it, it's just a lot of people. In my original video on electoralism and its propaganda was that left tube and to a lesser extent third party candidates created safe spaces for still bigoted people to continue feeling as though they're engaging in struggle while blocking out the consequences of their own fraudulence. Especially on the subject of electoralism, these groups tend to double down, which makes these spaces inherently unsafe for oppressed people to operate within. It led me to thinking about how to get these people engaged in, you know, allyship or joint struggle. But the sectarian tendencies inevitable within what I would consider to be a self-proclaimed vanguard become really evident in sections of the internet left. It is strengthened by the fact that YouTubers themselves exist as commodities within a market and that the algorithm has them fighting for visibility. YouTube is just another space where capitalism goes uncontested and where its tendencies can be replicated. A model of capitalist competition, win, 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 more, 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 is incompatible with a model that must enable unlearning and critical consciousness of oneself in relation to one's surroundings contrasted to what is found popularly, where you repeat the author or figurehead speech. So the YouTuber's methodology therein is consistent with that of any other commodity in their brand category. 
They choose to feed you information in developed, tested ways that get you psychologically invested, but not thinking critically. Because the truth is also that many of these people, outside of their personas, are removed from the tendencies and material conditions of their local communities, and do not use their platforms in a way that would enable greater community well-being. That truth is manifested in the toxicity of the communities that they create for themselves. And that toxicity leaks out to those consuming people's greater communities at home and online. This dissonance between sermon and practice amongst many in the so-called left runs contrary to the needs of the people, particularly the needs of those most oppressed. Struggle, particularly joint struggle, must be for life itself with those struggling for their lives. The dissonant behavior, however, is enabled by a social media landscape that overdistributes the unnecessary while obscuring people's true needs. This is a practice that is necessary for both the ruling class to put in motion and for these YouTubers to enact, because they themselves have created hyper-opinionated archetypal personas that are being used to generate profit or for their exchange value in order for them to obtain capital through other means. This also allows little autonomy for the YouTuber, and as of yet, I don't believe there are any broad unionizing efforts for these social media creators, although it's almost guaranteed at this age that they'd still be white-centered structures. They'd still be white-centered because in the process that these people must undergo to create, they not only objectify themselves, but also perpetuate a line that continues to subject the public to ruling class domination, spreading the tendrils of said domination under the guise of reform or leftism. Allyship and joint struggle must be defined by sought destruction of the social relations that allow one individual or group to wield power over another. That struggle must also be internal and is one that's antithetical to the behaviors and fan base structures that many of these creators have. These creators develop into figureheads that allow these other domination center tendencies to thrive. It's just really sad inside the left quote unquote because I got into organizing through reading theory online so I really did assume that these communities would at least be better off than they were 10 years ago but it really didn't feel that way from the response nor does it feel that way when I'm in organizing spaces it also begs the question as to whether or not this is an audience ready to engage genuinely or if this content is leaving people little room for critical thought if it's the latter situation and the longevity of this internal crisis has left me thinking that the supposed gains that we've made through these creators must be met with hurried revolutionary practice without them while the material conditions already should have been enough, I feel like even more so this gets this reaction out of me because they are proof of the system's ability to adapt to our conditions and to adapt to the BLM movement overall, which I feel like has been very strong. But this really requires community accountability and self-awareness of bias. What's up, Ronan and Youngblood? Let me hop in here for a second. There's a lot of historical visionism and a lack of accountability going on when we talk about these conversations. After years of building, MLK came to the reality. The biggest hindrance to the black people was not the Klansmen, was not the conservative or even the Nazi, but the white moderate. The Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. The white moderate today is progressive and liberals. They have very much co-opted our struggle, our pain, our resilience to their ends. Just like Reagan co-opted MLK's legacy to the detriment of the black people. It's redirection at the motherfucking finest which leads to lack of understanding the role white folks play in society, in our oppression, the impacts they make they do not have to consider, and a lot of times what other folks don't consider either. Much less do they consider what they're really advocating when they advocate their policies and thought processes, their theories and ideologies. I ask you this, how do you think MLK 
would feel, would respond to white folks shaming black folks for not being willing to vote to support a system that's based off of our oppression. For boycotting the electoral process, like MLK boycotted the buses in Montgomery. How would MLK feel as a socialist about us as black people refusing to engage in the fascist, white supremacist, bourgeoisie, capitalist method and refusing to abide to their narratives? Do not be fooled, that's exactly what we're talking about. One reality that has not been thought about by those who supposedly support us, supposedly stand solidarity, is some of these thoughts by Malcolm. We feel that the problem, number one, of the black man in America is beyond America's ability to solve. It's a human problem, not an American problem or a Negro problem. And as a human problem or a world problem, we feel that it should be taken out of the jurisdiction of the United States government and the United States courts and taken into the United Nations in the same manner that the problems of the black man in South Africa, Angola, and other parts of the world, and even the way they're trying to bring the problems of the Jews in Russia into the United Nations because of violation of human rights. We believe that our problem is one not a violation of civil rights, but a violation of human rights. Not only are we denied the right to be a citizen in the United States, we're denied the right to be a human being. And I got to go further than what Malcolm just said. I got to say, it not only applies to the black people, those who needed to decolonize from the black diaspora, from the African diaspora, but all those subjugated under neocolonialism, under white supremacy, under this form of fascism known as America. The same reason it's a human problem is the same reason we can't vote ourselves out of it, out of capitalism. Because the leaders that stand in capitalism are not interested in hearing our voice, but only mitigating our wrath. Unfortunately, when you raise this fact, here come the white moderates, progressives and liberals to fight for the interests of the establishment of the state, a pattern that hinders us at every corner and has for years. We are forced to push our fear through the eraser, struggling alone, ostracized, and silenced by those who say proudly that our lives matter, that black lives matter. To paraphrase Malcolm, the white folks can talk that pretty talk, but they keep doing those inhumane actions, which kind of comes down to this point that we can't trust white folks. It could be something different, but it falls on white folks to change that. Not just in word, not just by having conversation, but in actual action. I also realize it is imperative that we expound our analysis away from race, class, and gender reductionism and all those European concepts and thought processes. It is extremely important that we change our lens, that we stop seeing through snow-tinted glasses, that we see this with open eyes and not through the lens of white folks. Instead, white folks need to see it through the lens of the rest of the world. The way it impacts the rest of the world, those domestically informed. White folks need to see it through our lens. They need to accept that we are full intelligent beings that are fully cognition of our experience. Not just in voting, either. We as people of the African diaspora have the greatest wealth of intellectuals and wise people the world has ever known. Yet very rarely, our answers are accepted or listened to. Except when they're stolen from the Library of Alexandria, I mean. Then it's okay to listen to it, as long as you don't give credit for it, I guess. And the only time they even consider our knowledge is when it parrots them and their ideologies. When it parrots white perspectives and white thoughts. We are not your pets. We are not here to affirm you. I guess the real question is, will you accept that we are at minimum because those who live under oppression have learned things that, to be blunt, those who are privileged have never had to, have held perspective that you have never had to see, and understand struggle in a way that you may never, not to mention the history the African diaspora carries, the history that also the indigenous carry, all the wisdom that we've held for so many generations, but yet, apparently, it's supposed to be inferior, right? But just on a human level. Fuck the script, fuck any of that. What makes you think that everybody doesn't have something to offer? What makes you think that our experience when it comes to mass is just irrelevant? You think because we don't say we vote for Democrats? Like Youngblood pointed out, right? 
Over 50% of the population doesn't even vote. You think it's because we're ignorant? Or you think it's because we've seen and our ancestors have seen over and over again how our vote doesn't count even if we do vote? So what's the point? I think when it falls down, we gotta ask ourselves this. Are we gonna sit here and check a box? Or are we gonna step up? Are you gonna continue to affirm these hierarchies that are built by a system of white supremacy? Or are you gonna actually hear that maybe people have other perspectives that are very valid, coming from very intelligent, educated people? I don't know. That's for white folks to choose. That's for y'all to do. Cause in the day, whether you side with us or don't, I'm gonna ride for my destiny, for my people. But if you wanna side with white supremacy, or you wanna think that uh, because I don't vote, I am allowing fascism, then go right ahead. But the thing is, I see the generations of Europeans, the way they've stolen this land, the way they've enslaved my people, and the way they've committed genocide in both the native and the African diaspora, and many more people. And the fact that you think we're inferior because we didn't do those things, though you took the knowledge, our knowledge, and used it and manipulated it for your ends. And I know, I know, it's not all white people, but y'all benefit. And as a whole, you move. So you gotta think how you impact the whole, not just as an individual. Just saying. It could be different. The Irish could remember that they didn't hate, they hated the wasp too. So could the Polish and the Germans and everybody fuck else. They can fight for their indigenous legacies and try to be in solidarity. Or, thou could keep posting bullshit on Facebook and think you're being progressive when you're really oppressing my people. I don't know. That's y'all's choice. I'm going to keep fighting for my liberation. Appreciate being up on your channel. Rest of y'all like, subscribe, and get at them. These videos are dope, but they're not lecture or a panel. Bet you hit the bell notification spasm. Imagine all the content you just got handed. Politics so on point, you know we planned it. Image all deep, cemented, thighs landed. Who's authentic? Villains and young blood standing. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. Did do this for an outro? For like a shout out? Nigga? Yeah, I did it. You know, villainous out. Woo!